Howdy everyone! For today's Jolly Lark, I'm going to be painting up uh, some bone golems from Parabellum's Conquest game. Um, I both thought these were super cool models, I've been uh, playing some Conquest recently, and I thought those might be fun to see both for people who are interested in painting up these specific models or other models in the Old Dominion faction, which is kind of like an undead Roman legions. But I also think it might be interesting for anybody who's interested in tackling a big, complicated model with lots of different colors and lots of different textures without going too crazy. Um, when you've got a model that has a lot of different elements to it, uh, it sometimes can be a little challenging to paint it in such a way that it comes together as a coherent model. When you're painting a big giant dragon or something and it's all the same color, you don't really have to worry about that. You, you know, paint it all green, you paint it all red, what have you. But with a model that's got wood and bone and metal and, and religious icons on the front and some vases and flames and marble and, and all kinds of stuff like that, you can end up with a model that sometimes looks a little bit all over the place, a little scattered, a little higgledy-piggledy. So um, hopefully, whether or not you're actually painting some of these bone golems yourself, the video is interesting in how a couple different techniques that you can use to pull together disparate elements of a big complicated model. And this is a big model. You can kind of see by the size of my hands, um, it's on a 65 millimeter square base that gives you a little bit of a sense of the, the size of the model. And to start with here, um, what we've got is just a black primer coat with a white Xenothal spray from above. Um, the Xenothal spray, I feel like works even better the larger the model that you're starting with. And maybe that's not true that the larger the model, but the larger the model, the easier it is to do. That's a better way to say it. Because on a big model, you're gonna see those gradients from the white that's at the top of the model down to the blacks in the shadow a little more easily. If you're not familiar with the term uh, Zenithal Prime, it's basically priming it twice. Um, I think double priming would also be a very uh, a reasonable thing to call it. So this is double primed. I sprayed the whole model black, and then just directly from above, I sprayed the model white. I'm then immediately not taking advantage of that, and I'm painting all of the metallic areas with the Pro Acryl bronze. This is a nice dark brown metal color that can stand up on its own. It's fairly reflective, so it, it's good at creating its own highlights. The, the darker the metallic color that you use, the brighter the highlights will look relative to the shadowed parts. And you can really see that in evidence here where the lower surfaces, the shadowed surfaces of this bronze color look a pretty dark brown, whereas the areas of the bronze that are being hit by the lights from above look kind of a nice bright brass gold color. I started with the bronze because I knew I wanted to highlight some of the bronze areas with a brighter silver but I also want to have some of the metal areas just be silver. So for example, this kind of uh, torch razor sort of thing that makes up one of his legs is gonna get silver all over. And some of the smaller chains and such, I'm gonna paint those silver as well. So it's always good to think about what paints you're gonna use at the start of a project and think about things like this that you can do so that you're switching paint colors less often. So if you kind of have a mental list of what paints you're going to use in the course of a project, think about whether or not you can use any base coats as highlights for another color. So in this case, I'm both base coating with the silver, but also highlighting the bronze with the same silver. This just saves a little bit of time. So a uh, quick digression here while I paint some silver on the model. I had an interesting conversation over the weekend with somebody who didn't like speed painting. Um, you know, he wanted to take his time. He wanted to enjoy the painting. He just didn't think speed painting was fun, which, you know, fair enough. Speed painting is definitely the term that gets thrown around a lot, but I really almost wish we could call it efficient painting, quick painting, something like that. Think about, about driving from point A to point B. You're usually trying to take the shortest, most efficient, you know, way to get there, but you're not trying to race down the roads at 100 miles an hour either. That wouldn't be fun, wouldn't be safe. So I kind of think of speed painting that way for me. I'm trying to paint as fast as is reasonably possible without taking too many shortcuts, without compromising the, the safety of my miniature while I'm doing it. I'm not trying to, to race through the process, but 
I want to do it efficiently and quickly because ultimately what I want is more models on the tabletop. So next up is some Citadel Contrast Skeleton Horde. And I'm going to put this all over all the bones on this miniature. And this is a bone golem and there are a lot of bones. Um, you know, actually for being a bone golem, there's maybe fewer bones than you might expect. A lot of the model is made up out of marble or stone statuary and wood and stuff like that. But all the skulls kind of act as the filler in between the bigger parts. When I'm trying to paint efficiently, I'm usually trying to both work light to dark and inside to out. And in this case, I'm actually doing both. Now, light to dark means putting on a lighter color before darker colors. Because a darker color will have much better coverage, it will cover up a lighter color better. If you make any mistakes or overspill your bounds with a lighter color, it's relatively easy to touch it up with a darker color on top of it, and you probably don't need to go back and fix that mistake. However, if you mess up with a darker color, generally you might need to reprime the area or, or do something a little more drastic to fix that mistake. So I find it's faster to work from light colors first and then dark after that. You can be a little freer with the lighter colors, slop them around, and then be a little bit more careful with the darker colors. Working inside out just means doing the areas of the miniature that are closer to the core of the miniature. For a, a normal human, that would be doing the skin first, and then any cloth that's sitting on top of the skin, and then any weapons or ex and accessories or whatnot that are sitting on top of the cloth, and so on. In this case, it's doing the skulls first, and then doing all the stuff that's sitting on top of the skulls after. Again, I just find this a little bit easier, a little bit more efficient. It's easier to paint within the lines on the stuff that's on top than to reach in past something with the tip of your brush and paint something neatly that's on the inside of the miniature. So with all the skulls painted in the skeleton horde, I'm gonna go in with a darker color that is on the outside. In this case, it's the uh, Scale 75 Ink Intensity Wood. This is a range of colors they make that's kind of similar to contrast paints in that they are, are high flow, they flow into the cracks, but also color the raised areas. And I think this wood color is just terrific for doing exactly what it says on the bottle. It, it does, it just has a really nice effect for painting what would be a finished, uh, you know, man-made wood products like this door on the back of the bone golem. I think it's good for bows and handles and stuff like that. It kind of fades into a red in the cracks and crevices but stays a more yellowy color on the raised surfaces. It has a neat sort of two-tone effect that I think does a really good job of capturing finished wood. I don't tend to use it on natural wood. I didn't use this on my Sylvaneth army. I wouldn't use this on a tree stump or something like that. But again, I think it really does a good job of representing wood that's been finished, stained, and polished by people, not out in the forest wood of the Citadel Contrast Garagax Sewer, which, like the Intensity Wood, is a brown that produces some kind of yellowy highlights, and a, I think it's a, a, a good look for wood. It does go on a little bit darker, but the highlights are still fairly bright. It's pretty high contrast in between the lights and the darks. Um, so if you want a little less polished, a little more weathered look for the wood, this is another good way to do it. And in this unit, I'm going to do both and mix and match a little bit, have a little bit of variety. And one of my strategies for giving the whole model a cohesive look is going to be to get some color on everything. I'm gonna, as a next step, put some, the Pro Acryl khaki on all of the, the cloth bits, but uh, you know, to get some color on everything and then to go through with a series of washes and weathering effects that will tie the whole model together. Because this is a, a rough undead construct, I'm not necessarily trying to put this khaki on super, super smooth. One coat will probably be enough, even if it's a little patchy, because it is going to get covered up with another wash later on. So it's got some little, this little tabard that's kind of hanging down between its legs, and it's got a couple little cloth wrappings that, you know, bits of a burial shroud in different spots on the miniature. So I'm just going to give the whole thing a base coat of that khaki color for now. One of the advantages of using washes and weathering to pull things together later on in the process is that it's okay to kind of mix techniques now. You know, with all this scroll work and cloth and fabric, 
I'm using a more traditional base coating method rather than the contrast or the inks, and that's fine. You don't have to go all traditional or all contrast on a miniature. You can mix and match, and I think some shading washes and weathering later on are a great way to do that, to tie everything together. And speaking of mixing different ways of base coating a model or getting some color on a model, sometimes you can just use the primer coat as one of your base coats. And you can kind of see this emerging here as I finish putting khaki on all the cloth areas, is that the double primed black white, you know, zenithal areas of the miniature, those are a perfectly fine color for all of the stone bits of the miniature. So I'm just not gonna paint those at all. Well, I'm at least not gonna base coat them. I think the, the white over black spray effect that they have now is a perfectly good base coat for the rock. I do wanna add a little bit more detail um, and add a little bit of a just a pure white edge highlight to the upwards facing edges of all the stone areas. And I'm, you know, this is not a dry brush, I'm putting this on with a, a reasonably bold line, which will help those highlights carry through once we put a, a shading wash on top of them. So going all around the miniature, just adding a little bit of that white to the edges of the shapes. And I'm skip forward a few minutes here because it's kind of more the same. Uh, but you can see that the shapes of the stone areas are really starting to be feel a little bit better defined. All of the shading is still coming from the, the black, white, double primed Zenithal, but just putting a little pop of white on some of the raised areas helps sell it as stone a little bit better. It also, to my eye at least, and maybe it's just because I'm, I'm familiar with what a, a Zenithal primed model looks like, it helps it to look a little more finished. Um, you don't want to show up at the table and have it kind of look like half your model is unpainted. So adding a little bit of edge highlight just kind of helps give it a fully painted sort of look. Now on some of these larger flat areas, you can also add almost a little bit more detail, put some little scratches, um, you know, put a little bit of gradient with the white you know smear it around a little bit like that to get um, a, a broader highlight on some of those big flat areas um, just kind of work at this until you feel like you're you're happy with where you've ended up putting a little bit of white on the upwards facing edges and i'm not putting any white at all on the surfaces that are facing kind of the bottom or inside of the model like the inside of that claw didn't get any white highlights at all so with that done we're going to move on to the next step which is finishing up a last few little details that haven't gotten touched by anything else. Um, in this case, I'm gonna pick out all of the little pots and pottery that's hanging out in and among the bones and the, the wood with a little bit of a kind of a dull terracotta orange. In this case, I'm using the Citadel Contrast Griff Hound Orange, which is, has a fair amount of red in it and I think reads pretty well as like a terracotta style pottery, um, but you could use any sort of a, a dull orange watered down a little bit would work fine too. And the final step in base coating the miniature is going to be to get out a pot of bright gold. Now the centerpiece of this miniature, the focal point on the front of the miniature is this religious icon in the wooden frame that's haphazardly hanging off the front of the, kind of the tomb entrance, you know, as if these bone golems just kind of came together out of the ruins of a church or something, which I think these sculpts are great. So I'm gonna paint the religious icon in gold, this bright gold all over. And even when you're doing a really weathered, tarnished miniature, something to remember is that gold doesn't rust, gold doesn't tarnish. So adding some gold elements into a really worn, weathered miniature is a terrific way to add a bright pop of visual interest to something that is otherwise kind of rusty and crusty. So I'm gonna do the whole icon in gold leaf as, this, as if this was all you know, a solid gold leaf icon that would have appeared in a cathedral or something. And I'm also gonna take some of the bright gold and just to, again, because I usually don't like a color to appear in just one place on a miniature, and take a little bit of the gold and add some gold details scattered throughout the rest of the miniature. So you do that by adding you know, a little bit of gold to some of the little coins and discs that are made up on this miniature, add a little bit of gold to elements of the door or other little treasures, the handles of swords, stuff like that. Just kind of rotating the miniature around and, and trying to add a little bright spot of gold somewhere to pull, again, and repeating colors over the 
surfaces of a big miniature will also help make the whole miniature feel cohesive. And that's what I was concerned about with this miniature to start with, is that all the different elements would make it seem a little too jumbled. So with color on all the parts of the miniature, you could call it done here or move on and add a weathering wash over the entire thing. For the weathering wash, I am gonna pull out a tube of oil paints and some white spirits. Now, don't stop watching just yet. If you've never used oil paints, you don't have to do this. A wash of gnome oil would work fine. A wash of an army painter, dark brown wash would work fine. In this case, I thought that the kind of dark bluish gray of the Payne's gray oil paint would be a good complement for all the stone of the miniature. And Payne's gray is a pretty good kind of universal shade for lots of different colors. So I thought it'd be a good choice to do all over the whole miniature. Now, Pro Acryl has in recently introduced a Payne's gray acrylic. You can get acrylic Payne's gray uh, in lots of different places from artist stores. Uh, the Golden Shading Wash is a great product that mimics what I'm about to do here. Um, but on a bigger miniature, I do think that the oil wash is a little bit easier to control because you can put it on pretty quickly and easily without having to think too much about it. And then you don't have to worry about different parts of it drying at different times. You can just kind of put it on all over and then take it off where you don't want it to be. You know, take it off all at the same time too. Sometimes with big miniatures, putting on acrylic washes, you know, GW washes, you can end up with parts of the wash drying before you're finished the whole thing. You just have a little bit more control. Uh, I almost never use oil washes on small miniatures. I think they're a little bit of a pain, but on a bigger miniature, uh, I think it's worth it. And they're not, it's only a little bit of a pain. So if you're new to oil washes or you're, you're oil wash curious, a couple things to keep in mind before you have at it. Um, the little pot I've got pre-mixed there is a generous squirt of the Payne's Gray oil paint and a generous splash of the white spirits, a couple of glass mixing balls thrown in, and then mixed very well so that the, all the oil paint is dissolved into the white spirits. They do separate out pretty quickly, um, so if you're working for a long time, you might need to close the jar up and reshake it. Uh, alternately, you can mix those together in a plastic palette or something. Um, and just use it from there. But I, I use this, this is the, my go-to oil wash, so I, I keep a pot of it that's ready to use. If you're going for something that's thin enough to wash into the cracks and crevices, um, but not so thin that it doesn't cover the raised areas as well, you, know, you can see here as I'm painting it over the skulls, it's really making the skulls look pretty dark blue. So that's the next thing to keep in mind, which is don't be afraid that you're messing up your model when you're doing an oil wash. Um, I don't typically varnish before doing the oil washes, but you certainly can. It provides a little bit extra protection. Um, I did let the miniature dry well. That's another thing to consider is make sure all your, your base colors are fully dry before you, before you do the oil wash. Um, and if you'll notice, I grabbed a clean paper towel because I don't want to introduce oil paints. I don't want to, you don't want to mix oil paints and acrylic paints. Um, so a clean paper towel so that I can wipe my oil paints on a different paper towel since they do take a long time to dry, I don't want to accidentally get oil paints mixed into my acrylic paints. And I'm using a separate brush. I keep some cheap white handled brushes nearby and those just remind me that those are for oil paints. And I use different brushes for oil paints and acrylics. I don't do this that often, um, but it is sometimes a useful technique. And if you've never tried it before, it might be worth giving it a whirl. So we're just gonna continue working around the miniature, putting this not too thick, not too thin oil wash all over everywhere, except I'm gonna skip the gold gilt area. Uh, that'll really make that pop. Um, and we'll do a little wa separate wash on that later on. So pretty much really all over. And you can see at this point, you know, this wash is really darkening up everything. Um, and I'll just, I think I said it again, um, but you know, just don't be afraid that it's gonna ruin your miniature at this point. Um, it's gonna darken everything up. And then in just a minute, we're gonna take off a lot of this oil wash. So just keep working around, get it all over everywhere you want to darken up. This is essentially painting shadows on everything. And you know, contrast paints produce some shadows on their own, washes produce some shadows on their own. The Zenithal highlighting helps to create some shadows. And this is just gonna pull everything together. So once you've got a good coat on there, before it fully dries, it's time to take it off. And here's a little side-by-side -side of a bone golem on the right that has the oil wash on it, 
and then another bone golem on the left where I've already applied the oil wash and already taken it off. So you can see the bright spots of the model are still pretty bright, but the dark spots are similar to how dark the oil wash model is. And that's the look we're going for here. We want dark all over the shadows, but we're gonna brighten up the lighter parts of the model by taking the not quite dried off oil wash with off with one of these makeup removers. It takes an hour or two for the diluted oil wash to fully dry. If you do happen to let it dry, life gets in the way, it dries overnight, you can still take the oil wash off. Don't worry that you've ruined your model. It just means that you're gonna to need to put a little bit of the clear white spirits on your paper towel or on your sponge or whatever you're using to take the oil wash off first. But because this oil wash is still wet, it hasn't fully dried, the, you can just wipe it off with an absorbent little sponge thing. I like the little absorbent sponge thing, makeup applicators, um, a lot better than Q-tips, because with Q-tips you can end up with little stringy cottony things all over. Um, a lint-free paper towel, like those blue shop towels, works okay too in a pinch. Um, you know, other sorts of sponges work pretty well too, but these little makeup applicators are very, very soft. Uh, the sponge on the tips is so soft that you're unlikely to damage the paintwork below, and they're absorbent enough that they'll pick up a, a good bit of the oil wash that's on top. Now, this is hard to see in a video, but I'm really not pressing down very hard at all with this little makeup applicator. I'll put a link to these in the, the description below. These are handy. You can pick them up at a local beauty supply store. You can order them by the, the bucket load on Amazon. Um, but yeah, just kind of puttering away at this. There's no particular rush because the oil wash does take a little while to dry. You don't you don't have to rush it. And so what I'm doing here is just kind of letting the natural motion of the applicator dictate where the lighter spots of the model will be. I'm not reaching into the little cracks and crevices. I'm not being too aggressive about trying to get it off everywhere. But essentially, if you use the applicator to remove the parts that are easy to reach, you're naturally gonna leave the parts that are harder to reach in shadow, which is then gonna create more naturalistic looking shadows. So you can see you know, on the front here, perfect example, around the relic, this part's easy to reach. I'm taking off most of the oil wash from this stone frame and from the wooden frame around the relic because it's easy to reach. This is a part where the light is going to reach, so it's not where you want the shadows to be. Spots that are harder to reach, like underneath this bone arm, I'm not gonna remove much of the oil wash at all. And as a result, it's gonna stay in a much deeper, darker shadow. If you're new to this, trying out an oil wash on a light colored model is a great place to start. You know, if you look at the whites of the stone, the khakis of the cloth, you really get that dramatic difference between the light parts of the model and the darker oil wash when you're putting the oil wash over a lighter surface. The, the darker the surface you're putting it on top of, the less obvious it's gonna be. Now, you can see as I've been working here, I've been swapping out my applicator for a new applicator occasionally. I'm flipping it around to use the other side of the applicator sometimes. You will find that the applicator, once it's picked up a certain amount of paint, you need to flip to a fresh side or grab a fresh applicator because once you feel like you're just smearing it around, the goal is to be removing it from the raised parts of the models, not moving it around. So. Once you feel like your applicator has enough paint on it that you're, you're moving it around, it's time to switch to a new one. So with the oil wash all taken off, there is about a 24 hour lag in between when I recorded the first parts of the video and this part of the video. I wanted to make sure the oil wash was totally, completely dry. Really let that oil wash fully, fully dry for about a day before you go back and do more. Again, I say this a lot in my videos, you could leave it here call the miniatures just about done. Maybe there's a little detail or two you'd want to paint, but brightening up some of the areas a little bit more, um, finishing off a couple little details. We're going to run through those real quick to really polish the miniature off. The first stage in the polishing is getting a little bit brighter ivory highlight on all of the bone areas. So I'm just taking a big dry brush, dry brushing all the bone areas, and you can see if I'm hitting a little bit of the corners of the wood, hitting a little bit of the corners of the cloth, that's fine too. 
and you're just hitting the easiest to reach outward facing surfaces of these bones. You don't, you're not reaching into the armpits. You're not reaching into any cracks or crevices, just the outer bits. Um, and look at the ivory is a great highlight color for lots of different things. So don't be afraid to brush a little bit of the ivory lightly on the pots or the edges of the wood and stuff like that. Next up is a very quick coat of Agrax Earthshade on some of the cloth areas. Just give it a little more of a, a brown, moldy shadowing. Um, I'd let this sit in the cracks. This is a big enough model that I'm going to kind of let it sit in the cracks and just use my finger to pull a little bit off the raised areas, which will give it a little bit brighter highlight than if you give it an all over wash. Um, the same thing applies to any of the little wrappings and bandages elsewhere on the model. If you caught my previous video about the painting rusty, decayed old metal, you know I like the Vallejo Mecca washes. This is the light rust wash. And I'm just gonna apply this mostly all over the metal areas. I say mostly because I'm not trying to do a solid even coat. I want most of the metal to have some of this rust wash on it, but I don't want it to be all over. If you put it all over, you're gonna end up with essentially turning the silvery looking metal into a bronzy, brassy looking metal. But if you put it on in a patchier coat, you'll end up with something that looks more like rust and decay. Once you've got enough of that rust and decay on, you can add a little bit more weathering with some of the Citadel Technical Neelic Oxide paint. This will turn any of your metal areas looking like they're kind of a verdigreed brass bronze. Um, I'm going to just apply this kind of a little bit scatter shot all over the model, turn some of these little rondelles and some of the decorations to make it look like they're brass. The same little makeup applicators we use for the oil wash can also be useful to pull acrylic washes off of the raised surfaces of smaller areas where your fingers won't fit. And the last little bit of weathering here is gonna be some of the Citadel Contrast Militarum Green, which is a great kind of dull, natural, mossy green that I think works really well for adding just a little bit of surface mildew, algae, age, I'm gonna grab a really junky old brush and just kind of dab this in kind of randomly around different parts of the area, in the miniature. It, it'll look a little weird if you put it on any of the brightest, most highlighted areas. So you see as I'm moving around the miniature here, I'm tending to put it in areas that are a little more in the shadow of the bottoms and in the corners of things where water might accumulate and algae and, and mildew might form. And just kind of, again, kind of a scattershot approach, putting it, but putting some of it all over the miniature so that it's still, even though it's kind of polka dotted around, it's going to look cohesive when it's all said and done. Oh, I should mention the base. At While the oil wash was drying, I went ahead and finished the base using the exact same techniques that are in my dry, cracked desert basing video. You can put a link to that in the description below if you want to do that, or you can apply any other basing techniques you would want to the mini. Next up is a real quick highlight of just, just the tippy tops of the gold leaf area with the same bright gold we used before, just to give the gold a little more of a gleam and get it to stand out a little bit more than it did after a few different washes and such. And then as a final step here, and this any sort of lighting effects or flames usually are the last things I'll do on a miniature. Uh, this is very similar to what I did with my Fire Slayer's army. If you're interested in seeing even more of that technique, you can check the video out on the Fire Slayer's. Um, so for the flames, what I'm doing is giving the whole flaming torch here a nice, even base coat of kind of a, a deep pink. In this case, it's the Pro Acryl Magenta, but you could use any sort of vivid pink that you want. Now, the flames aren't going to stay pink. This is just a base coat for a traditional yellow-orange flame. Pink flames might look cool, but not what I'm going for here. But just keep watching. You'll see how this evolves into from pink into the traditional yellow-orange flames. So while that's drying, I'm going to give the wood areas of the miniature one more quick gray highlight. Uh, if you look out a window at a tree, a lot of trees, you know, bark and wood actually ages to more of a gray color. Uh, the new Pro Acryl Red Gray is terrific for this because it's a very, very warm gray that has a little bit of red in it. And it's just a great highlight color for weathered, aged wood. So I'm just going to give all the wood areas just a quick hit of this on the edges to give it a more dried out, weathered look. 
I'm gonna grab another dry brush and with some of the same magenta, I'm just gonna dry brush a little bit of the magenta on some of the areas that are around the flame. Uh, I didn't do this immediately because I wanted to add that wood highlight first. Um, and this is, this is getting set up to add a little bit of the OSL, the object source lighting to the torch. Don't go heavy on this, light, 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 light touch. You could even skip this step, but really, really light, just a little, little bit of pink on some of the raised edges of all of the areas around the torch here. If you imagine that the torch is a ball that's shooting out spikes from it, of light from its center, you just think about where that light would hit on the miniature. It's gonna shoot out in every direction away from the torch. You can see the same thing on this other bone golem here where that it has a torch on the top, um, which means that not as much light is gonna hit the miniature because the light coming off the torch is gonna largely be going up and away and you're only gonna get a little, little, little bit of pink on the area below and directly under the torch. So by this time, all the magenta should be dry. So we're gonna grab a little bit of the scale 75 ink intensity white which is a very, very thin white and do a white wash over all of the pink. If you don't have this color in your collection, that's no problem. You can easily make this by just adding some water or paint medium to a nice white paint, but the, the ink intensity white works great for this right out of the bottle. It's nice and bright. Um, you can see how it gathers in the folds and crevices of the torch. And this is gonna provide the bright inner core of the flame. But I'm gonna go ahead and wash it all over on the flames. Because this is a wash, give it a minute to dry, make sure it's fully dry before moving on to the next step. For the next step, we're gonna grab some Pro Acryl Transparent Yellow. Uh, you can see on the palette down there, this is a very, very transparent yellow. Uh, I'm not. This is not a wash. I'm gonna to try to put this on in a thin layer all over the white washed magenta. And this is, you could call it a glaze, you could call it a filter, there's different terms for this, but you're essentially just putting down a very thin layer of transparent yellow all over the fiery areas. This is gonna turn the pink into orange, and it's gonna turn the bright white into a bright yellow. This is gonna be a brighter yellow in the center of the flame than we would have been able to easily get otherwise. An old brush, synthetic brush with short bristles, I find works well for applying a thin layer of a transparent paint. Um, same, similar brush you'd use for a dry brush. And we're gonna apply the same thin layer of translucent yellow all over the areas that got any pink dry brushed on them and a little bit beyond so that the light that's hitting the objects around the torch is orangey, kind of closer to the torch and fades into yellow. Let's get back to the model we've been working on the whole video um, and show you how this torch below that's in a little bit more shadowed area, it's still gonna be the same brightness. You know, unlike parts of the model where they're gonna be darker, kind of the lower down they are, you want any sources of light on the model to be similarly bright. The torch doesn't get less bright just because it's sitting on one of the, the mini's legs. Um, this also actually makes the effect of a lit torch it sells it a little bit better when the light source is in a darker area of the model. The previous model, um, where the torch is sitting on top, the top of the model tends to be the brightest. It still works fine, but I think on this model, it, where the torch is down low, it really looks good to have that torch light shining into the shadows, and that pink dry brushing helps tell that story. And as you can see, this is pretty quick. I'm not doing any complicated wet blending. This is a pretty easy way to get a source of lighting on your miniature that'll look great on the table. To brighten up the flames even a little bit further, what you can do is grab a little bit of that, just a little bit of that ink intensity white and pop it into kind of the center of the flames. Don't do it on the upper kind of tendrils, but like right in the middle, kind of bottom middle of the torch is a good place to add some nice bright white highlights like so. And then finally, to finish off the flames, I'm grabbing some bright orange, whatever the brightest orange you've got is. I'm just brushing a little bit of this onto the tips of the flames to add a little bit more vibrancy to the very ends of the flames. You could go back and do this with a little bit of red if you want, but I tend to leave my flames more of the candy corn colored white, yellow, orange, 
and as soon as it starts to go red i feel like it loses a little bit of brightness so just a little bit of bright orange whatever you're, like i said whatever your brightest orange is on the tips and there you go pretty easy way to add some lighting effects lit torches and such on your miniatures and for the next final detail i'm going to swap my brush out for a 0.005 micron pen uh, i find it much easier to scribble on these little micro words onto a scroll than to do this same thing with a brush um, it's just a lot easier you're not going to end up with smeared paint all over the place i just kind of do this really just i'm not trying to write anything particular just kind of scribbling on some naturalistic looking words with some ups and downs and spaces between words and stuff like that you can add as much detail as you want as much detail as your hand is steady you can try to fake a little like illuminated letter or gothic letter or something like that there these little ultra fine words on scroll work is a is a nice touch to finish off the model and that's the model done so hopefully that's useful hopefully you got some good ideas from this would really appreciate if you like and subscribe to the video keep those questions coming i'm always happy to answer questions about any of the techniques and processes in the comments and i'll see you next time for another jolly lark